Hi everyone, this is Matt from Open Builds. In this instructional video, we're going to show you how to wire up your Sphinx 55. So this is going to be all inclusive. We're going to show you how to wire up your LED light ring, your micro limit switches. Everything's going to be configured in a drag chain, so it's going to be nice and aesthetically pleasing. Of course, everything's going to be wired back to your black box motion control system. So this is super exciting. We're going to be using this controller on this machine. We're also going to be going through the software. So Open Builds offers free control software. Everything's going to be configured into your controller, and you're going to be operating this machine by the end of this video. So make sure to stay tuned, follow the steps, and let's get started. Okay, for this first step, we're going to go ahead and organize our wires here right in front of us so we can attach those to each one of our motors on the 55 Sphinx. So what I have here is a seven foot cable and then three three foot cables. They're all four conductor wire and that's what we'll be using to attach to each one of our motors. So the first thing we want to do is focus on each one of our motor connectors. So you'll see that two connectors are attached to each motor. You can either disconnect or keep it connected. What I'm going to do for the purpose of this video and just the ease of the assembly, I'm going to keep the pins attached to each motor and we'll connect our wires to this outside pen here. So starting off first with the largest wire, which is the seven foot cable, I'm going to move here to the Z axis motor. So over here at the Z axis motor, what I'm going to do is loosen each one of these pens that are on top of the connector. So what you should see is these metal inserts at the bottom of the housing. So once you loosen these, these are going to move down and that way we can insert our wires and then clamp them back down. So using the seven foot cable, which is the largest of the four, what we're going to do is just match up the colors here. So these are already paired off by the coil pairs in the motor. So for your convenience, all you have to do is match up the colors to what you see here. So it's red, blue, green, and yellow, and we're going to work our way from right to left. All right, just make sure that those match up. Red with red, blue with blue, green with green, and yellow with yellow. Okay, so next we have our three foot cables. What I'm gonna do is just take one here to the X motor, which is on the left side of the machine. So let's go ahead and focus on that side. Okay, so we're doing the same exact thing that we did for the Z axis motor. Loosen the pins, insert the wires, and match up with these colors, and it's that easy. All right, double check those wire colors, make sure that they match. Okay, so moving forward, we have two more of our three foot cables. So we're gonna move back to our two Y motors. So we have our Y axis motor, which is right here on the left side if you're to face the back of the machine, and then our Y2 motor, which is on the right side. Obviously these cables are the same size, so you can use either one for either motor. I'm gonna start here with the left side first and attach that three foot cable. All right, once again, just double check those colors, make sure that they match. All right, and let's finish up with our last three foot cable and our Y2 motor here. Okay, so that finishes up this last motor here. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step. So on this next step, we're gonna be assembling our micro limit switches as well as our LED light ring. So what I have laid out here is all the parts that we're gonna be using in this step along with my tooling. So we have three micro limit switch kits you can see that I have two already assembled here in this specific uh, configuration. So basically with these screw heads on the outer top plate and the orientation is going to be specific to the way that they're gonna be mounting to each axis. So I have two in that same configuration and then I have one broken out here, which is gonna be configured a little bit differently, but we're gonna go through the assembly and uh, make sure that everything is configured properly there. Along with the micro limit switch kits, we have a single L bracket one M5 eight millimeter screw, an LED light ring, and the two M5 six millimeter screws that come with the LED light ring. And then of course our wiring. We have three sets of three conductor wire. We have two at seven feet, one at three feet. And then of course we have our two conductor wire which is gonna be attached to our LED light ring and that is at 13 feet. So to get started first, we're gonna focus on our micro limit switches. So we're gonna go ahead and assemble this micro limit switch here. So pretty much what you do is take the top plate, stack it on top of the limit switch here, and take your two M3 self-threading screws, 
and we're going to tighten those into place. What I do first is get one started and then I'm going to insert the second. That way I can make sure that everything's aligned properly there. You can see also that I have my indications for ground positive signal facing this direction. So I would make sure that that plate is oriented in this direction so you can see those labels. So as far as the rest of the assembly, we're gonna take a nylon spacer and slide it in between these plates of PCB. Each plate is made from PCB, which is circuit board material, if you're unfamiliar with that term. You can also use your ball driver to kind of slide that into place. And what we wanna do is flip this around, add our M5 screw, slide that through, and you can see my solder joints are facing me. Go ahead and add your spacer, and we're gonna leave this like so, and we're gonna go ahead and Turn to our Z-axis at the very top of the C-beam end mount. And here at the top of the Z-axis, this right hole on the C-beam end mount is where I'm going to mount this micro limit switch. So next we're going to focus on these tapped holes here on the double wide gantry plate. We're going to insert a single L bracket so we have interaction with the micro limit switch. So bringing in that single L bracket and the 8 millimeter screw, make sure that you have the hole spacing correct. We're looking for the edge and the hole that's furthest away from the edge and that's going to mount to this tapped hole here in the double wide gantry plate. Okay so once you have the single L bracket in place what I'm going to do now is go ahead and turn this pulley system on top make sure that I have interaction between the plunger and the single L bracket. And you can see that I do and that's max travel there for the C axis so that's exactly what we want. We don't want to limit ourselves when it comes to travel on this machine. Okay, so next I'm going to grab one of the pre-assembled micro limit switches that I had laying here. And this is going to be for the x-axis micro limit switch. So over here on the left side of the machine, we're going to insert our micro limit switch into these tracks of the C-beam. So for this micro limit switch, what I try to do is align the limit switch with this end of the C-beam for our y-axis. And of course, I'm going to insert the drop in Tina in this top track of the C-beam. And the reason for doing so is you want this position to be before the actual extrusion. So before your X carriage interacts with one of these wheels, you want this to hit the limit switch. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that that position is correct. So now when I move the X carriage, it's going to interact with that plunger before it bottoms out on any of the extrusions or wheels. So that's a good interaction there. And you can always move this later on if you want more travel. That's completely up to you. And just make sure to test that because you want it to hit the limit switch before you hit a side plate. So next, moving to our last micro limit switch. This is also configured in the same way that the X limit switch is. So we're going to move to the Y axis, which is on the right side here. And we're going to insert that into the top track of the C beam on the front right side. So finding the location I want to mount this limit switch in, I'm going to choose this top track of the C-beam right before my lock collar. That way we have max travel on this machine. Okay, so now that it's configured like so, basically the limit switch wire is going to go underneath and we're going to encase it with a slot cover to go through the system and back to our controller. So next, moving to the LED light ring, what we need to do is detach our router spindle mount and this is going to mount underneath the router spindle mount. So it's pretty simple. We have two black angle corner connectors on top that's connecting this to the plate. So we're going to go ahead and loosen those real quick. And then taking the LED light ring with the router spindle mount flipped upside down here, place that on top and use the two M5 six millimeter screws to mount this into place. Okay, so that's what you should see. And from there, we're going to go ahead and focus on our double wide gantry plate on the Z axis. So finding our two outer tap holes here, we're going to go ahead and mount this back into place. All right, that's nice and secure. Okay, so next we're going to go ahead and attach our wires to our micro limit switches as well as the LED light ring. So starting with the seven foot cable here, I'm going to go ahead and pull this pen connector and wire this up and then reconnect it to the micro limit switch. Okay, so here at the X micro limit switch, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect this pin connector. And you'll see the labels here, ground, positive, and signal. So with our three conductor wire, we have our positive, which is red, ground is black, and then the signal is blue. 
So we're going to position those exactly as it's indicated here. So like what we did with our motors, we're going to loosen our pin connectors first and then insert our wires. So working our way from left to right, black on the left, red in the center, and then blue to the right. And then tighten those down. And let's insert that to our micro limit switch. I'm going to take the excess of wire and throw it towards the back of the machine. And don't worry about the mess. In the next step, we're going to label all of our wires and get everything organized. So next, I'm going to take my 7-foot cable here of the three-conductor wire and move to the top of the Z-axis where our other micro limit switch is. So just like the X-axis micro limit switch, I'm going to disconnect my pin connector and loosen up each one of these pins. And working our way from left to right, black to the left, red in the center, and blue to the right. All right, plug that back in. Once again, I'm going to toss this to the back. Okay, so next I have a three foot cable here that's going to be connecting to the Y axis micro limit switch. So let's move to the front right side of the machine. Go ahead and disconnect the pin connector and same exact thing we did for the others. All right, plug that back in. Once again, I'm going to just toss this wire to the back. All right, so lastly, we have the two conductor wire that's going to attach to our LED light ring. So on the right side of the LED light ring, you'll see a two pin connector. And there's labels on the bottom of the LED light ring for negative and positive, but I'm going to show you here with the pins facing upright, black to the left, red to the right. So that's your negative and positive. Go ahead and connect those and let's reattach to the LED light ring. And that completes this step. So let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, so on this next step, we're going to label all of our wires here. So I've set out some painter's tape and a permanent marker, and that's all I'm going to use for this step. So starting first with this front section here, you'll see three wires coming off. We have our micro limit switch, our LED light ring, and our Z motor. So I'm going to start with the Z motor first. Always start with that point of origin, trace it back, and all of our motors will be four conductor wires. So that's a, a sign there that you do have the right one. And taking some of the painter's tape here, what I like to do is just wrap this all the way around the wire because when we feed this through the drag chain, we don't want it to rip. So important that you just wrap this all the way around. And then I'm going to label this ZM for Z motor. Okay, moving on to the next motor. I'm going to locate the X motor here. Same exact thing. And I'll label this XM for X motor. Okay, next we have our Y motor and our Y2 motor. So trace it back from the point of origin. And the Y motor, I'm just gonna label YM. And the Y2 motor, I'm gonna label Y2M. Okay, next I'm gonna move to the micro limit switches, starting here with the Z micro limit. Same exact thing we we're doing for the motors, wrap the tape around, and I'm gonna label this ZML for Z micro limit. Okay, next the Y micro limit, which is right up front. Once again, I'm going to label this YML for Y micro limit. Next, we have the X micro limit. And last but not least, you have the LED light ring. Trace this one back, and we're going to label this one LED. Okay, so all of our labels are wired, so let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so on this next step, we're going to be assembling our x-axis drag chain, as well as building a cable tray for this back end of the C-beam here for our x-axis. So what I have gathered here is all my parts I'm going to be using in this step. I have one 20 by 20 V-slot rail at 500 millimeters. I have a one slot cover at 500 millimeters, drag chain at 500 millimeters, three single L brackets, three M5 T-nuts, two M3 T-nuts, two M3 8mm screws, two drop-in T-nuts, two slot washers, two 6mm aluminum spacers, and three M5 15mm screws. Along with that, I have some tooling set aside here, an M5 ball driver and M3. Also, I'd uh, keep some snips handy because we are going to be cutting down the slot cover to fit into this portion of the 20x20. 20 20. So starting off, we're going to go ahead and take our 20x20 20 20 V-slot rail, 
And what I like to do is just go ahead and slide the slot cover into place. And another way you can do this is just snap the slot cover into the top face here. So whichever one's easier. Now one thing you'll see is how I have space here on each end. So I pre-cut this slot cover for this assembly. So you see I have about a, an inch on each side. That's precisely what you want. So go ahead and cut that down. Make sure that you do have about an inch on each side. So next, I'm going to set this to the side. And I'm going to move to my single L brackets. Making sure that you have these oriented correctly. What we're looking for is the edge and then the whole spacing that's close to the edge. That's going to mount to this back lip of the C-beam. So we're going to do that with two of our single L brackets. So next I'm going to take an M5 15 millimeter screw, add a six millimeter aluminum spacer, add a slot washer, and a drop in T-nut. Okay, next I'm going to go ahead and mount that to the left side of the C-beam. And we're going to do the same thing on the right side. Okay, so coming back to the 20 by 20, inserting an M3 T-nut first here on the left side. This is going to mount to our drag chain. And then next, I'm going to add an M5 T-nut. This is going to mount to our single L bracket. And then on the right side, just add one M5 T-nut. Okay, and then bringing in our two M5 8 millimeter screws, we're going to mount our single L brackets to the M5 T-nuts, and same for the right side. Okay, so now that we have our cable tray in place here, what we're gonna do next is configure our drag chain and set it up to where it's gonna be mounting here on the X carriage plate. When it comes to the drag chain, you're gonna see two end caps here with the whole configuration for mounting. What we need is one end to mount to our cable tray, which is this end. And then the top end here is going to mount to our single L bracket that we're going to install to the center hole of our X carriage plate. So everything's configured right there. Just going to put that to the side, move here to the single L bracket. We're going to mount that to that center hole of the X carriage plate. So once again, looking for that whole spacing that's close to the edge here, run an M5 15 millimeter screw through. And on the back end, we're going to add our M5 T nut and then tighten that into place. Okay, now before we mount our drag chain, we need to go ahead and run our wire through this drag chain. So taking some painter's tape, what I'm gonna do is gather the three wires that are gonna be running through the x-axis drag chain. And I'm gonna find the ends of each. And once you've located the ends of the wires, taking some painter's tape, I'm gonna wrap the ends. And it's so much easier to run this through the drag chain when you just tape the ends. So, Definitely a good idea to go ahead and do this. And from there, taking the top portion of the drag chain, it's gonna to mount to the single L bracket. I'm gonna feed this wire through. You can see what I'm doing here is just pulling the slack through. And basically what I wanna do is leave a good amount of slack here. So we're gonna configure our LED light ring into a slot cover here on the side. We're also going to bundle these wires together. So making sure that we have enough slack there to mount the drag chain, and that looks pretty good there. So keeping the drag chain here to the side for now, next we're gonna take our x-axis micro limit switch, and I'm gonna run that through the slot cover and out the other end here. And we'll see it come out the other end here. I'm gonna run all that slack through the slot cover. And next, taking the drag chain, what I wanna do is feed this micro limit switch wire through this bottom hole here of the drag chain. And then it's gonna run in line with the additional wires. So next, taking the top portion of the drag chain, I'm gonna run an M3 eight millimeter screw through the center hole here of the drag chain. And then taking our M3 T-nut, I'm just gonna thread this on top of that screw. All right, so we have that in place. Taking our additional M3 eight millimeter screw, we're gonna mount in the center hole once again to the M3 T-nut that we placed on the left side of the cable tray. Okay, so we have plenty of slack here on our X-axis drag chain. So what I wanna do now is take my 250 millimeter slot cover and we're gonna insert that into the front track of the Z-axis C-beam. 
So over here at the left side where our LED light ring wire is placed, what I'm gonna do is make sure that I have enough room here since our gantry is gonna move up and down from within the C-beam. I wanna make sure that we do have enough length here so it's not gonna disconnect. So taking the slot cover, I'm gonna place it here at the bottom of the channel and run it up to the top. Okay, and that should be the end result there. So you see we have plenty of slack left over, and of course on this side as well. So the main goal is to make sure that we have complete movement here in our gantry system without unplugging the LED light ring. So testing that full travel, I actually need more slack here in the slot cover. All right, and you can see we still have plenty of room here, and this is maxed out to the top position. So that looks good. So next, I'm gonna focus on the additional slack here that we have for our micro limit switch, as well as our Z motor. I'm just gonna pull some of the slack through the drag chain. And that looks good. So we have all of our wires ran through the X-axis drag chain. We have our 250 millimeter slot cover in place of our Z-axis. So we're ready to go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so on this next step, we're gonna be assembling our Y-axis drag chain to our Y-axis here on the 55 Sphinx. So what we need to gather here is our 500 millimeter drag chain, two single L brackets, two M38 millimeter screws, one self-tapping screw, two M3 T-nuts, a 500 millimeter slot cover. Of course, my tooling that I have situated here is my power drill and my ball driver. So to get started first, I wanna go ahead and move our attention to the back side of the Sphinx. We're gonna take this end cap off and insert one of our single L brackets with the same self-tapping screw that we take out. So coming over here with the power drill, I'm gonna go ahead and take that single self-tapping screw out and go ahead and put that end cap to the side. And taking the single L bracket with the whole spacing that's close to the edge here, I'm gonna go ahead and insert my self-tapping screw and mount this into place. All right, just make sure that that's as straight as possible there. Next, coming over here to the end of the cable tray, we're gonna mount an additional single L bracket. Once again, making sure that the whole spacing is close to the edge. That's gonna be mounting to this 20 by 20. And using our self-tapping screw, we're gonna go ahead and mount that into place. Okay, so bring our attention back here to the drag chain. Once again, we wanna make sure that this is configured in the right orientation. So this top piece here is gonna mount underneath our single L bracket. And then our opposite end is gonna mount on top of this single L bracket. So this top portion of the drag chain is where we're gonna feed our wires through. So let's go ahead and take all of our wires that we ran through the X-axis drag chain. And we're gonna add one more wire, which is our X motor. And once you've located the ends of the wires, we're gonna go ahead and grab some painter's tape and just tape these ends so we can feed it through the drag chain. And grabbing the top portion of the drag chain here, let's go ahead and feed these wires through. Okay, so once I have the wires fed through this drag chain, I'm gonna go ahead and mount the top portion to the single L bracket with my M3 eight millimeter screw and M3 T-nut. So mounting to this top left hole here of the drag chain, go ahead and run that M3 eight millimeter screw through and add an M3 T-nut and thread that into place. So now that I have the top portion of the drag chain in place, let's move to the back section and mount that portion. Once again, using the left hole here of the drag chain, we're gonna run an M3 eight millimeter screw through and then tie that on with the N3 T-nut in the bottom. Now the best way to do this, just move the machine off the table slightly and we'll thread that T-nut in place. Okay, so next we're gonna go ahead and focus on our Y-axis micro limit switch. We're gonna run this wire all the way back to the back of the machine. So just feeding that through the gantry plate here and then taking the 500 millimeter slot cover I'm gonna go ahead and place this into the track of the C-beam. Okay, so now that we have our slot cover in place, you can see we have everything configured nicely. Our drag chain is now installed. Everything's running back 
to the back of the machine so we can go ahead and install our controller next. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so on this next step, we're gonna be assembling our black box motion control system as well as our 24 volt power supply. So these two kits require some assembly. So I'm gonna link those two videos up top in a card and you can follow along with those and build these up real quick. It's about five minutes per assembly. And once you get those finished, this should be the end result. You'll have your power case kit established to your 24 volt power supply. And then you'll have your black box motion control system already assembled. Now, in addition to the assembly of these, you'll see that I have my pin connectors laid out here. These all come with your black box. So make sure that you do leave these to the side because we're going to be using four of the four pin connectors for our motors and three of our three pin connectors for our micro limit switches. Along with that, you'll also need two M5 six millimeter screws and two drop in T-nuts. This also comes with the black box kit. And then the 24 volt power supply as well as the power wire that's gonna provide power to our controller as well as just the power plug that's gonna provide power to your power supply. Along with that, my tooling, I have my ball driver and flathead screwdriver. All right, so to get started here, we're gonna first grab one of our four pin connectors we're going to start connecting our motors to each one of these connectors. Now what I'm going to start off with first is the X motor, just down here. And I'm going to loosen each one of these pins on top, just like we did for the beginning of this assembly. And make sure that those inserts at the bottom of the housing, and then we'll insert our wires and clamp it down. So that should be the end result. Once again, you want those inserts at the bottom of the housing there. Now coming here to our X motor wire, which is a four conductor wire, you see four wires. We're going to insert these in the order that I describe. So with the pins facing upright, we need to insert red on the left, blue next to red, green next to blue, and yellow next to green. This should be red, blue, green, and yellow with the pins facing up, working our way from left to right. All right, since this is our X motor, we're gonna flip the black box around here and you'll see the input section for our motors. We're looking for the X motor, which is located here on the right side. And we're simply gonna plug this in. It's that easy. Okay, so now that we have that one complete, I'm gonna locate another motor. Okay, so I've located my Z motor. Once again, have it labeled as ZM. So I'm gonna grab one of my four pin connectors and just like we did the X motor, we're gonna do the same thing for the Z. Once again, with the pins facing upright, red, blue, green, and yellow. All right, since this is a Z motor, we're gonna look for the Z motor input here. All right, moving on, I'm looking for another motor, and this is the Y motor. Same exact process. We're just gonna plug that into the black box when we're done. Okay, since this is our Y motor, we're just gonna plug that into the Y motor section. And last, we have our Y2 motor. Same exact process. And let's finish that up and plug it into the black box. Okay, the Y2 motor is right here next to the Y. Simply plug that in. And that completes our motors. So let's go ahead and move on to the micro limit switches. So I've located my Z micro limit and I'm gonna grab one of my three pin connectors just like we did our motors, loosen those pins and we'll insert our wires and plug it into the black box. So on the input section at the very top, you'll see your limit switch section, which is gonna stay ground positive and signal. So I'm gonna show you here with the pins facing upright, you want the black wire to the left, red in the middle, and then blue to the right. And this is our Z micro limit. So that's gonna go to the left here. So we're gonna go ahead and plug that into place. Next, I've located my X micro limit. And the same exact way we did the Z, loosen the pins, plug it in that order, and plug it into the black box. All right, plug this into the X limit, which is on the right side here. And last, we have our Y micro limit. Same exact process. 
All right, and we're gonna plug that right into the middle here. Okay, so that should be the end result. Our micro limits are attached as well as our motors. So everything's been configured to the black box. Next, what we need to do is go ahead and insert our mounting hardware. So when mounting this, I like to keep the power switch up top here. So obviously we're gonna use this bottom slot here of the 20 by 60 as part of the frame. So I'm gonna insert an M5 six millimeter screw on this side for our mounting configuration as well as the left side here. So one thing you'll have to do is unplug the X motor to access that slot. Once you do that, you can plug that right back in. And then on the back end, I'm gonna add my drop-in T-nut. And then of course, the same thing on this side. And from there, I'm gonna go ahead and mount this into place. All right, so now that our black box is mounted, let's go ahead and move on to the power supply unit. Now, one thing to pay attention to is this right switch here. From the factory, this is gonna come at the 230 volt, we need to switch this to the 115. So make sure you do that. Otherwise you will not have power to your system. So with the power supply, we're gonna simply plug in our power cable here and our power wire. It's gonna be plugged into the black box as well. Uh, one thing that I'm gonna do here before I plug this into the black box is I'm gonna find my LED light ring wire and I'm going to piggyback on top of these two wires. Now you have this option to do it like I'm doing here. You can either trim the wire so you don't have that additional length or you can use the additional length and you can plug it into your power supply. So it's completely up to you. I'm gonna go ahead and do it this way. So black is gonna be with black, red is gonna be with white here. So negative and positive. Okay, and let's plug this into the black box. It should be on the right side. So in the top right corner of the black box, we're gonna go ahead and plug this in. Okay, so that completes this portion of the step. Next, we're gonna go in and we're going to organize all of our wires and just really work on the aesthetics portion of this wiring assembly. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so on this next step, we're gonna go ahead and organize all of our wires here. Just really work on making sure everything's nice and tidy. So we need 15 zip ties and a pair of snips. And let's go ahead and get started first by focusing here on the back section where we have this additional length of wire next to the black box. So what I'm gonna do here is gather the wires together here. So you'll see we have the LED light ring. What I'm gonna do is run that underneath the black box here. And ideally what I'm trying to do is create a nice organized bundle here of all the additional wires. And from there, I'm gonna tuck it underneath the motor and secure it to one of these 40 millimeter aluminum spacers. So taking two of my zip ties, I'm gonna extend this out and create a large zip tie so I can secure this bundle into place. Now once again, this comes down to your preference. You can always just strip down the excess wires and plug that in. Generally, I keep the excess just in case I wanna configure this differently. If I decide that I wanna move my black box down there, I have that option. So don't limit yourself if you don't have to. Okay, so that's one on one side. I'm gonna do it once more on this back end of the bundle. Okay, so now that I have the bundle secure, I'm going to tuck this underneath. And from there, I'm gonna go ahead and secure this to one of my 40 millimeter aluminum spacers. So what I'm doing is I'm actually wrapping through one of the zip ties that's securing the bundle. Okay, so now that I have that secured to the 40 mil spacer, I'm gonna come here to the motor connector and I'm gonna secure each one of these connectors that are attached to the motors. So what I do is I run it through each sets of wires, back around and I tighten it down. Okay, and for extra measure, I'm just gonna go ahead and strap that to the 40 mil spacer as well. All right, just make sure all those connectors are still plugged into the black box. And that completes this portion back here. So now we're gonna to go to each motor and zip tie those connectors, starting with the X motor first. So bringing one of my zip ties in here, gonna go ahead and tighten this down as well. 
I'm also going to zip tie this additional bundle of wire here. All right, now let's move to the Z-axis motor. Once again, zip tying this connector first. All right, now moving to the Y2 motor, we're gonna go ahead and zip tie that connector as well. So next I'm gonna come in here and using the additional cutoffs that we had left over from our additional steps, I'm gonna drop a couple slot covers in here to keep this Y2 motor in place. And then the additional excess, I'm gonna go ahead and bundle here. and I'm gonna attach that to this 40 mil spacer. Okay, so that completes the wire aesthetics portion. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so for this next step, we're just gonna go ahead and attach our USB cable to our laptop and our black box and go ahead and get started on the software portion. So all we have to do is take the USB side here and plug that into the laptop. And then the serial port section is going to connect to the right side of the black box. All right, so right here is where we're going to go ahead and plug this serial port section in. All right, so now that we have our USB connection established to our laptop, let's go ahead and move on to the software portion. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is open up our browser, and let's go to openbuilds.com. From here, we're going to go to the software tab, and we're going to open up OpenBuilds Control Machine Driver. From here you have options for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I'm using Windows, so I'm gonna download the executable for Windows. Go ahead and save. All right, run through the prompts and install. And you'll see that the OpenBuilds control is started. Go ahead and select it. And from here you'll see the top left corner, our COM positions. We need to select the FTDI USB to serial. Uh, this is COM4 on my laptop, but it could be different for yours. But just look for that FTDI driver. So go ahead and connect. And the first thing you should see is your alarm state. So as you can see, it's blinking red here, and that's precautionary just in case you had your machine powered on and you hit a jog right or left and you weren't expecting it. This is just precautionary so you can, you know, have some time to set up your machine. So what we need to do is just go ahead and unlock that. We don't have power provided to our machine currently. All we're doing is setting up our Gerbil settings. So what we need to do is come up here to the top, select Gerbil settings, and you're gonna select the OpenBuild Sphinx 55. Now this is a default option. So you go to the scroll bar here, select the Sphinx, and you have the 55 or the 1050. So depending on which configuration you have, you would select that option. I'm going through the Sphinx 55, so I'm gonna select that. And of course you can save to firmware. So it's that easy. So now we have all of our settings configured into our controller. So the OpenBuild Sphinx 55 has these set parameters as well as values. So if you go into the advanced settings, this is somewhere you can go to tweak your machine depending on the specificity, if you uh, modified it or anything like that. This is the place you would do that. But these default settings have been tested and they work fantastic for these machines. So I wouldn't suggest changing anything, especially new users. Just follow along with these settings. They work great, no issues there. And then as you get into this hobby even more and you learn more about the system and what you can do with your machine, then you can come in here and start messing with these settings. So let's just go back to the control tab here. And what we need to do now is go ahead and power on our machine so we can go ahead and test our movements and make sure that everything is functioning correctly with our machine. Okay, so now that we have our machine powered on, you should hear your motors activated as well as your LED light ring should be shining brightly there on your work surface. So everything's functioning correctly there. Next, we're gonna go ahead and move the machine around a little bit. So what we have here is X, Y, and Z coordinates, and these are our jog buttons. So positive movement for the Y axis is gonna move this gantry system to the back towards our controller. And then of course, negative movement's gonna move it back towards the front. X axis is gonna to move to the right towards our X motor. Negative movement's gonna move it back to the left. Z-axis, negative movement's gonna move down, positive movement's gonna move up. 
So with that being said, let's go to incremental jog and we're gonna select one millimeter increments to make sure that everything is correct. And as you can see, positive movement is moving towards the back of my machine here. And that's for the Y axis. For the X axis, everything looks good there. And then of course the Z axis, everything looks good there as well. Okay, so everything is moving correctly. All of our positive and negative movements are functioning as they should. So now we're gonna go ahead and test our micro limit switches. So up at the top here, we're gonna go into the troubleshooting tab, and this is gonna offer us some insights to the end stops and inputs. So since we have micro limit switches installed, if we select the limit switch, it's going to trigger an alarm. And that's because we have hard limits enabled. So what we need to do is just go ahead and hit cancel. We're not gonna clear the alarm, so I want to show you what the pin looks like when it's activated. So this is the X limit. So you'll see that the X limit turns on and it releases once I release the plunger. So same for the Z. And of course for the Y as well. So now we know our limits are working correctly. We're going to go ahead and unlock our alarm, go back to the control tab, and we're going to home all. So it's gonna start with the Z axis first, and then the Y and X. Okay, perfect. So that was a homing cycle completed. And as you can see, everything is functioning correctly for our machine. So let's go over some of the details of the software. So some really cool features. First off, in the Wizards and Tools application here, so one of the first things you're gonna do is a surfacing job. So you wanna make sure that your router is perpendicular to your work surface, which is your spoiler board. So the way that you can do that is obviously tram your router, but also enable a surfacing wizard. So you make sure that that material is completely level. So what you would do is select the surfacing wizard. And as you can see, it is simplified. You put in your bit diameter, your step over feed rates, width and length of your machine, and of course your skim depth. So really easy stuff here, really intuitive software. Also in the Wizards and Tools, you have the mobile jog widget, which is really cool. You scan this QR code and you can jog your machine with your phone. Also in the Wizards and Tools, you have the ability to calibrate X, Y, and Z axis. And this is a really useful feature, especially for custom machines. You can really dial in the movements of your machine by calibrating each axis. It's a really cool feature here and it's simplified with the wizard. Definitely really cool stuff there. And along with that, you also have a servo pin. So if you wanna attach a pin with the servo, you can also do that as well. And this wizard gives you that option. Then it's just simplified here. So you would input your values here for the servo. And from there, you would just calibrate that application. Also, we have the ability to customize shortcut key assignments. And this is for the continuous jog feature. So generally I run with the defaults here and you can save and apply and then select the continuous jog option. And from there you can jog your machine with your keyboard, which is really cool. So really cool features here. Generally I just stay in the incremental jog. I like to know exactly how far my machine's gonna move. I would suggest you know any new user also to uh, adhere by the incremental jog function because it's just way easier to uh, understand where your machine's gonna go based on those increments. You also have the ability to change to inch mode. So if you really can't just grasp the, the metric system, inch mode is provided. So you do have that option as well. I prefer millimeters mode when I'm working with CNC machines. It's just my preference, especially when I really wanna dial in the movements of my machine. That's just how I work. So the millimeters mode is what I stick with. And then of course, down here we have our digital readouts, also known as the DROs. So these are all work coordinates of your machine. So when you make a movement in an X, Y, and Z coordinate, it's going to reflect here. So you can also set zero to X, Y, Z, which you would do for any project that you're starting. You need to set that zero point so your machine knows where to start. And then you have the go to zero function. So based on where you set that zero point, you can go back to that position. Also, we have the 3D viewer, which is really, really cool. 
And you also see that my machine profile is listed here based on my default setting that I chose. But what's really cool about the 3D viewer is you can actually interact here with like a cam application. You can see your vectors and your tool paths, and you can just really see how your project's going to be manufactured. So you also have the simulation tool and you can increase the speed of that as well. Really cool stuff there. So next to that, we have the serial console tab, which is basically machine communication. So whenever you connect your controller board, you're gonna see a list of your Gerbil settings. Also, if you see errors while you're running a job, this would be the place to copy and paste that and send that over to the forum to you know inquire about any complications that you're having. So really cool stuff there as well. And then you have macros, which is for custom waypoints that you would set up on your machine. Definitely uh, something that more advanced users would use. So uh, I wouldn't dive into that right away, but the feature is available. So as you learn, you'll find this feature to be very helpful. We also have the G-Code editor, so you can write custom code. You can also interact with the existing code and you can see exactly what you're working with here. So all this stuff is just really cool. It's um, you know very self-explanatory, it's intuitive software. So as you're working through this, you're gonna find things about the software that are just really, really awesome. So also at the top here, we have the tool on option. So if you're using an IoT relay, you can turn on your laser, your spindle, or plasma. You have the coolant on option if you're using um, a misting system or anything like that. And then of course the tool off. Along with that, we also have the check size feature, which we'll use once we set up some code for our machine. And this is really helpful for just really gauging how large the project is in your work area. And then of course in the troubleshooting tab, we have the Open Builds forum. So you, you can actually interact with the Open Builds software engineers and ask questions and give suggestions on things that you would like to see for the software. So that pretty much covers the basics of the control software and the features that are available. So what we're gonna do now is go into openbuilds.com and we're gonna go ahead and download some G-code and watch our machine work. So this is gonna be an air cut that we're gonna perform we don't want to install our router yet. We just want to make sure that everything is functioning correctly on our machine. So let's go to openbuilds.com. And up at the top here, we're going to go into the software tab once again and open up OpenBuilds CAM G code generator. So once you have the CAM G code generator open, we're going to go into settings and we're going to set up our machine profile. So what we have here is the OpenBuilds black box. That is our controller. And we're also going to select our machine profile. So OpenBuilds Sphinx. 55 is what we're using. If you have the 1050, you would select that option. Uh, as far as the tooling goes, we'll just leave the spindle in there. Obviously, we don't have a router installed yet. It's just going to be an air cut, but we'll just go ahead and leave that installed. So after that, we're just going to go ahead and save, and you'll see your work area here, which is really cool. This is basically exactly the work area that you have to work with inside your machine parameters. So whenever you're creating jobs, you would make sure that it's within these guidelines. So what we're gonna do is go into workspace and select our hello world example for a CNC hello world. And from there, it's gonna go ahead and create the G code for this job. So as you can see, it's generated the G code here. We have an inside cut, a pocket, and then an outside cut. So it's just uh, three different options here for you. So you can see you know, what each one does specifically. Now this job is built to actually route out. So whenever you get comfortable and you know your machine is where it needs to be mechanically and electronically, go ahead and strap a router in there and cut this out. We also have a tutorial video for this specific job as well. So go ahead and transfer your G-code to OpenBuilds Control and you'll see the 3D viewer populate here with your job intact. As you can see the different layers here of the code, really cool. So now what we need to do is go ahead and establish a zero point and we'll check the size and then we'll run this job. So where I'm at currently is kind of like a close to a center position of my machine, at least on the X axis. So that's fine there. I know this job is about six inches by six inches. So what I'm gonna do is lower my Z axis. So I bump into 10 millimeter increments here. I'm gonna bring this down because the job is gonna interact like it's actually delving up and down into the material. So I'm gonna bring that down. And then the Y axis, that looks fine. We're we can actually bring that up a little bit slightly and then of course the x-axis that's fine so we can set the zero point here for x y and z now we can check the size let's see how large this job is 
really love that feature. Okay, so that looks perfect. So we're going to set the zero once again. And let's go ahead and run this job. And you can see I'm following along here on my 3D viewer. And this is in real time. It's following the machine profile here. We're on the hello. So that's the inside cut. And it would move on to the pocket. And then, of course, our outside cut here for the world. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and stop this job. You can either hit pause, stop, or stop job here, which is immediate. So we hit stop job. Now we're just going to go ahead and home all. Okay, so that completes the wiring and software portion of this video. And as you can see, your machine came out great. It's operating flawlessly. Now it's time to work on some cool projects. So make sure to stay tuned for future videos. Subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and make sure to check out the Open Builds Forum.